just um, pass around since so they're just moving around the room. A couple of them. Portraits of them. One of the mom and one of the sisters. Just so you get a sense of their being. And I've written down on a kind of paper, which I will hope, though, will turn into people talking and having some questions. My work on a translation for seven years has been part of a long fixation, which I hope to put to rest here. My own new collection of poems, Come and See, was written at the same time as I was doing a wall of two, and they are in many ways complementary. They seem this way now in any case. You could say, in other words, that they're all part of the time that is past. Um, the word adaptation is the only one I could find that contains the physicality of working with broken bodies of text. In my case, the wrecks I was given to work on were equal to the devastation of the poet's lives. And so, in a certain way, I was involved in a reconstruction process that was also a mortal struggle. I'll start with the most difficult, which we just heard, Buchenwald, where many of the poems were written. A place where adaptation in the human sense is impossible. The site of a massacre or a place of incarceration, I believe, is one of the most sacred we have on earth. These spaces are marked off as ones where God did not appear. The ashen field, like a graveyard for a meteor pounded into the ground, opens our eyes into the subatomic. Here, goodness is forever described as left out, excluded, real. We identify goodness by its being gone. Remaining scrawls, eyeglasses, shoes from one of these sites have a power emanating from the fate that came to each one of their owners. A passerby is drawn, or I should say made speechless at such signs of a negative force field. Survivors from any prison experience carry the place with them as if the lenses of their eyes had been bent. Until the ground site is wild, widely pollinate, pollinated by alien seed and there is movement in the earth, it will remain petrified. A Wall of Two is a small collection of poems by two sisters written in Polish and adapted from rough English translations by two Polish speakers into poetry. I began work on it in 2000 and was published by UC Press in 2007. Until then, my only experience with adaptation was through my mother's work for the theater, and in particular, her adaptation of Finnegan's Wake. She was from Dublin herself. She wasn't collaborating with translators, but was working intuitively with her knowledge of Dublin street talk and Irish humor from the turn of the 20th century and giving them bodies in drama. She found Irish actors and did all her editing during sessions <coughs> when they read the script aloud together. Adaptation is a word that suggests an ability to change expectations and discomforts into manageable qualities for a time ahead. This is what happened with her work on Finnegan. And it's a word that's used in horseback riding, biology, politics, and literature. Adaptation to a new environment can be a reciprocal way of being hospitable to something that receives you. You adapt yourself to their ways. The one already there is the one that is invaded from the outside and isn't required to do more than be. In flesh and blood, you could say the body of work is the equivalent of the beloved. But with this body, the intruder, reader, translator, adapter is always approaching something that's better adapted to itself than the newcomer will ever be to it. If you know you're not improving something, then what are you giving it? More importantly is, what is it giving to you without having any desire to give you anything at all? This last question can't be answered until 
long after the give and take have settled its scores, and you've had time to experience yourself as having been permanently altered by something you thought you were controlled. My mother's happy, my mother's time spent adapting Finnegan's wake gave her the false but happy feeling that she was at home in Dublin, not in America. And it became the basis of her film that was made a few years later, continuing her engagement with Irish actors in Ireland. Happiness is what she got from adapting the book for the stage. It was not quite the same for me. I can say that I might never have taken on the job of editing and translating a wall of two if I had known how deeply it would affect me and if I had not known one of the authors as well as I did. Even though Alona Carmel went on living for 55 years after the events that produced the poems and almost never mentioned their existence, their discovery after she died was mesmerizing. Ilona was already imprisoned inside the Krakow ghetto at age 14 when I was born. During that October, the Babel of Britain was being fought. It was 1940. Ilona was rushing from street to street as a courier in an increasingly guarded section of the city. In snowy Buffalo, I was an infant eyeing the rooms around me in the lap of a kindly Nazi nurse who was deported back to Germany before I was born. Two years later, my father went to Europe to contribute to the war effort as a colonel in the US Army. A year after that, he wound up at the Potsdam Conference during the so-called reconstruction of Europe when he visited Hitler's compound outside Berlin. He brought home a trophy, a shard of turquoise porcelain from the to toilet the Fuhrer sat on. This two-inch triangle, along with a star from shrapnel in his cheek, was the only evidence of what had happened to him while he was out of sight. But there were news photographs of war all around the house. There were shady textured pictures, not symphonies or songs. They showed starvation and battlefield injuries, children with dirt and sores on their faces, women who would represent the foreign feminine for the years to come. They were, I suppose, my first experience with photographs that caught stories that would never be told. Ilona began her terrible odyssey at the age of 14 when a child has an independent view of adults and generally has an attitude of scrutiny and rebellion. Sexuality has barely risen into the surface of the skin. It's a time of androgyny and daring. Ilona's sister, Henya, was 17 and already in the zone of tears and longing. She had slipped into the ordealism, my new word, of the feminine and would fall in love and marry in late adolescence and retain all that, even as her family descended into the labor camps. Both were well educated and Henya pinned her meager hopes for freedom on what she knew about the French and Russian revolutions. Here is a poem of hers after all the work of translation on it was done, or adaptation, I should say, to the German people. Are you asleep or what? Blind, can't hear? That's the Marseillaise and the crash of the world falling down. Hear it? It means freedom is coming. I bet you want that too. A red star on Soviet tanks. Life returning while you sleep. Wake up, people of Germany. Get ready. Step in time to the Marseillaise. You better revive your hearts and souls as if the love <coughs> of your life was coming home. Or maybe you don't want freedom, just more sleep. Even then, won't you fear the red flag? If so, wake up. The workers are on their way. And on the corner of every German street, a Bastille is about to be beaten down by raised fists. Thank God her doors will be smashed open. No more gates. So hey, who dares go first into this marvelous chaos to hoist the flag on equality? And after? When it's over, we'll erect a huge structure out of concrete and steel 
and inscribe it in gold with the immortal word, Fraternité. This poem was among the most integrated and straightforward in the batches of rough drafts I was handling. Still, it was like all of the original poems, fractured while sometimes straining towards a conventional poetic form that would be finally unmanageable, and the poet would revert to something closer to monologue. Like many of Henya's poems, it was written to an imagined someone, which made it easier for me as a reader. Her younger sister, Ilana, was already uh, was also speaking aloud in her protest poems. And perhaps in this case she was addressing her sister. It sounds quite personal. Both of these poems are among the only that have a dash of optimism. So this is a woman's poem. Listen, that's our blood pulsing, purple, wild, red, foaming like the power of fire that can't be contained, never. Will you remember how close we came to thinking in the sun, spellbound by a strange face, how suddenly our blood surged up and we struggled madly. Only 20 years old, remember? It was then our blood began to sing behind bars, wires, everything. When she was finally able to write a memory of her childhood, Ilona was in a hospital in Sweden, undergoing corrective surgery on her legs, one of which was crushed by a German tank and amputated. She would be there for three years. Her parents had died in the war, and she only had her sister, Henya, who moved ahead to America to prepare the way for her. Ilona could not rid herself of the memory of her father, asking the SX officers to let him pray before he was taken away. His gesture and her impatience with it may have spread out the foundation of her belief that she was beyond salvation. She believed in a God she couldn't believe in. Meantime, I was always waiting for my real father to return, though he was someone I then barely knew. My early childhood was spent in unspoken anticipation of his arrival from the dark land of newsprint. The end results of war became fodder for the future existentialists of my generation and offered a free course in phenomenology. Ilona and I shared our messianic longing, but from opposite directions that met in impassioned It was about 38 years after the war that I met her, hunched on her crutches in the corridors of MIT. We hit it off as if we'd been interrupted from an early conversation. We had both just arrived there to teach and were nervous co-conspirators in the weeks to follow. We were outsiders who had opened the door to the same room at the same time. It was one of those rare encounters that we all have in our lives. A face is there the welcome to each other seems preordained. Ilona had little interest in poetry. She wrote novels. She was reading Montaigne, Rosenzweig, and Karl Rahner in her hospital bed at the end of her life. All her own poems were written during the war, and in one she described their content as nothing more than desire for help or revenge. In my introduction and afterward to the book, I tell what I already knew and what I learned, especially of the years she and her sister spent in the Krakow ghetto, and then in a series of labor camps, and then book of Ilona wrote the following poem about writing poems. First, there is a soul and a seed, swelling, secret, deep, a troubled premonition, dust, germination. The seed is sharp, Patient, it spreads into words, strokes, sound, branches. Then you are its gardener. Its rhythm comes like a gale that sways in your soul. Your pen is your shovel, transplanting these words into ridges on paper, where they flower in air, tear off, and disappear. 
Writing on paper is very vegetable and vulnerable. It can be burned, buried, consumed, changed, or it can rot and blow away. I'm sure that writing in prison feels far nearer to decomposition than anyone else I can imagine. But prisoners do write, and they do dream of their poetry having cultural value. It might become part of a genre slipped into an anthology, adapted to music as a ballad or for the stage. It might be fully appropriate and filter like pollen into a new triumphant flower. Suffering is precious and personal. Some might even say that it holds up the heavens with its radiance. How a person manages their suffering and how it is managed by others is often surprising. Some people never speak of it and some give it away, some hold it tight, and some drop it on the path and run. For many of us from the 60s, the appropriation of suffering is a theft that occurs when a person has run out of ideas of his own. He turns someone else's words, or she, into gold. This, of course, happened in the music industry, but it also happens in all the arts, causing some artists to feel like imposters and turn into ironists. This has given some critics the privilege of reading suspiciously that is, to read against a novel drawn from a copy. It seems like an ontological inversion to be rewriting something that was already written, like drawing a description of a crash on a blackboard and saying that this is what happened. A few, few people who were readers for the Carmel Poems were upset that I, a non-Jew and a non-Polish speaker, was in charge of this project. The question of ownership arose in ways I'd never before encountered. But I did understand the anxiety behind the charges. It was another version of the suspicion between appropriation and experience that had been tested in the 60s and was a prelude to our discussions now about hospitality and hostility, issues dating back to Abraham at least, and being dragged now into contemporary life in new forms. Does language in all its genres and intentions belong to everyone, or only to those from certain traditions? Or is it beyond ownership and it free flies on the fly? My way of addressing this question was by imagining what the Carmel sisters would want me to do, and even what their poems would want. I consulted with their families and alone, remembering Yolanda's ambivalence about anything to do with the Holocaust and herself. I came to the conclusion that she would be happy to see these poems in English, as long as I did it right. <laughs> English was both of the sisters' chosen language for writing their novels after the war. They never went near Polish again. And they had gone to extremes to save the poems from annihilation during their first translators chose from about 150 pages a group of poems that were the most articulate and the least like me, late 19th century first imitations. Their job was the usual one, to show me the equivalency between the written words in English and then to read what I made of what they had made of them and tell me if I was right or wrong in my interpretation. I had to trust them implicitly, just as a future reader who trust me to be faithful to the original Polish poem. It was important for me to have more than one Polish reader therefore for each poem. I spread out the English versions that they sent me and the Polish originals beside them. And at first I experienced the Polish as crooked and incomplete, like organisms still evolving, or as little figures adapting to the light and paper that was now their habitat. Many times I examined them like microscopic species, hoping that I could see relationships between letters that would stir up a recognizable activity. This way I hoped that the Polish language would remind me of something somewhere in my brain. I did see letters that echo each other, but in the end I was faced with the problem of two languages with very different sounds and implications, and two sisters with very different I was confronted with texts that had been written in haste under oppressive conditions, 
had been typed up 50 years before, passed around unrevised, and then translated into English ver versions by people who didn't know the poems. The ones in English were like skeletons, or at best, crap nude sculptures of the original poems. Every bit of them seemed to call for reconstruction. But English is like a grassy field on which many greens and flowers grow, some surprising and long from far away, thankfully. I had the advantage of what you might call a hospitable language, even as I shared the occurs belief that the difference between the supposed artificial language and the natural languages lie with their idiosyncrasy, their peculiarities, and it proves to be insurmountable. The artificial language in this case was English, and yes, the difference between Polish and English was insurmountable. I had Henya's statement on her native language in front of me. She wrote, I scratched on a steel plate my soul in blood, my language. And I wished I could at least hear her read them in order to echo her tones. She was said to have an especially fine voice and reading style when she read aloud to the other prisoners in the labor camps. The poet Yves Bonnefoy, who has written so beautiful in our translation, has discussed the way each language holds its own ethos close to its syntax, and in essence, has an essence. Supposedly, poets understand this better than others. But these were two people under 20s whose chances of analyzing and revising were very limited, if not in they were at the same time determined to see their writings as poetry and to read them to others as such. Henya, more than alone, I believe that transforming an experience from a prose description into verse would increase its worth in a nearly supernatural sense. She was compelled to make a poem from the most awful events, as if by sounding them out in Polish, she could resurrect an aborted self and her lost youth. As she wrote in one poem, I can't look for a new homeland because Poland has captured me with its poetry. Of course, this turned out not to be the case. For both sisters, a single misery might have a chance of being recorded in a time out of time if it were stopped by the hand of poetry. Even bad poetry, or even poetry that had no possible chance of being revelatory or resolved, would still not end up as a mere document of the moment. Nothing could have been more repellent to these two than documents, except perhaps sentimentality. Here is Henry's poem called My Life, which could be written by any prisoner at any time. My life consists of the banging shock absorbers and hydrosulfuric stench in the boiling, stinking, panting factory line. Day and night, lamplights always flicker out there. Every day, fog and gloom. The labor is stretched to breaking. Expectations are extended. Dreams go undreamed. Cemetery days, one after the other. White caskets, the planks of our bunks, await our thoughts that grow ill in this hateful prison block. For Hania and Alona, the years they lived behind barbed wire could also be salvaged by writing in a form that would be read aloud later, and also stuffed in pockets, sewed into dress linings, handed over to a cousin in the death march of prisoners released from Buchenwald mowed over by tanks. The poems would be passed on as being more, more, more than ordinary cries or letters, but not much. What did the Carmel sisters and I share? We shared being female, disgust with bullying, hatred of nationalist and racist societies, nostalgia for childhood, a propensity for religion, and a love of 19th century literature. We shared our century, but obviously far different intensities. We would all have read Tolstoy, Turgenev, Maupassant, Dostoevsky, and translation, 
and would never love any literature more. In this sense, our experience with reading books from far away afforded us a single landscape made of translated words. The remote, queer shape of that terrain was what we grew up to expect from great novels. The ghost-like outsider, the translator, would be a figure we had in common. Penya wrote one of this poem called The Bastard, one of her best, and one that remembers books more than anything. It's totally written in the camp and uh, in despair, but there is literature and community. Because I was homeless, I was at a loss. Really, I was an illegitimate child whose longing howled, and like a hound, I scavenged neighborhoods for a mother's warm touches and breasts. I wandered a long, long time and found nothing like a mother until I found you, Russia. Russia, hold me as if I were your own against your body made of golden green, your meadows long and yellow over the Volga River. Far off, the lonely Ackerman steps conjure up a great poem and his sonnets. I will always love Georgia drenched in sunshine and its hot, starry nights, velvety, intoxicating, and the blue Caucasian sky. Let me stay, let me love the white Siberian taiga, brutal as it is. Let me love close up Odessa and her poets, the capital of courtesans, Stalingrad, wet with blood, and mighty Moscow, steel and cement. Let me love one place wholeheartedly, and then I will finally forget that I have no birthright. Russia was the homeland of the Colonel Sister's mother. She and her family were offered safe passage into Russia from Poland out of the Krakow death. But she stubbornly refused, saying she would rather die at the hands of the Germans than of the Russians. Still, Russian literature had brought the two sisters happiness, and this was thanks to the work of the translators, whether they were brilliant at the job or not. That impersonal third person hovered over our books as a disembodied consciousness. One who knows two equally and does not favor one over the other. In this sense, anyone well educated in the 20th century would share the experience of reading literature and translation and would be happier for it. What was problematic for me in the adaptation process was the way the English translations lay on the page, unbreathed. They lacked an inner ear, the sounding that accompanies composing from inside your body. In fact, as I said earlier, decomposition had set in. The idiom of that era was already over. So I committed myself to making the poems as modern, clear, and plain as possible. I would remove, but never add. I would attain to a third kind of language by getting used to the broken English. Like a first year medical student, I forced myself to come intimate with the symptoms before I learned the surgery. I carried the rough drafts around with me and whispered them on buses and benches until I heard them. Then I rewrote the given lines in a way that brought back the body or the figure inside the body. For me, it's in the space between the thought and the word that a realization takes place. But of course, my own thought is made of blood and motion, and my words are all tongue and ear. So if I am attempting to turn disembodied words into an experience, I had to reproduce the process of thought, movement, and breath that lowered the words to my level. In India, translation is sometimes called reincarnation. I would never have anticipated the low-grade depression that hung over me time I was working on a wall or two, or the way that my time with those poems would infiltrate the idiom of my own work. The news of the world horrified me more than usual, and I went around saying, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, of any reports coming in. I realized I was suffering from an unnatural melancholy by exploring the worst of the century I was born in. And I'm just going to end with a little segment of Proust, which says it all. 
that he wrote it in such a lost time. I looked at three trees. I could see them clearly, but my spirit felt there was something behind them that was failing to grasp. In their ingenuous and passionate movements, I recognized the infinite regret of a loved one who has lost the power of speech. When the carriage turned the corner, I was sad as if myself had died, I myself had died, had turned my back, denied a God. Thank you.